Hello and welcome back uh, to this 24th lecture of uh, BioMEMS, Biomicroelectromechanical Systems. Uh, I would like to just have a brief uh, review of the previous lecture. You know, we talked about uh, RNA transcription and translation processes. Um, transcription again is basically conversion of um, uh, a, a double stranded DNA in, in the chromatin region of the nucleus into a messenger RNA and uh, translation again essentially is, is the change of language that means from um, the RNA into proteins or a sequence of amino acids. And we saw how beautifully this nano machinery inside uh, the living cell works um, especially the ribosome which kind of assembles all the different messenger RNAs and uh, coordinates that with the transfer RNA which is um, essentially around in the cytoplasm. And uh, these transfer RNAs again have amino acyl groups which kind of uh, conjugate with uh, the messenger RNA on a base pair or on a, or a base triplet by base triplet basis and uh, thus uh, there is a sequence of amino acid which is generated. So, this is a very, uh, very interesting process because uh, this, this coding essentially uh, is also uh, responsible for the physiological state of health of a living cell. So, we also uh, described about antibodies and antigens and uh, we will be doing this a little bit later in uh, more details. And then we briefly talked about enzymes where we were just about to begin what we know as the Michaelis Menten equations of the formulation of an enzyme substrate complex. So, today we will actually focus a little more on these three areas and then try to go ahead and uh, uh, derive uh, these set of equations and see what the, the enzyme catalysis rate would be in a typical chemical reaction. So, to begin with uh, let us look at why all this is important really. I mean we are talking about enzymes, we are talking about proteins, we are talking about antibodies. Uh, from a biomems perspective uh, it is almost always essential that uh, we have uh, immobilization mechanisms wherein all these groups, all these uh, different uh, moieties uh, are used for capture essentially of uh, targets okay, in the analytes. And for sensor design point of view it is a very, very important aspect uh, that these antigens, antibodies etc., uh, which are specific uh, uh, to capture of a certain reagent. Um, or, or certain analyte is immobilized onto the surface of biochips or biosystems. So, some of these immobilization mechanisms are for example, antigens and antibodies as you can see here. Uh, they are complicated folded structures binding and, and their binding mechanisms are through hydrophobic hydrophobic interactions, hydrogen bonds, uh, ionic and van der Waals interactions. Typically, it is uh, the anti almost all antibodies are like these Y shaped molecules and they are proteins essentially with two heavy chains and one light chain. The light chain is at the base here and these two are really the heavy chains of the antibodies. And uh, what is also important to know is that there are these uh, groups on the top here at both ends which are also known as epitope sites. We will be doing this in just about uh, next slide in a little bit later detail. So, the idea is that these sites correspond to certain constitution. Uh, certain uh, molecular constitution which can bind to flowing uh, specimens like cells, bacterial cells, mammalian cells, uh, different capture agents so on and so forth. And um, so, this is one definitely one of the mechanisms of immobilization or capture of uh, a certain specimen over a surface assuming that you can somehow localize this antibody onto the surface of your choice along this lighter chain here at the bottom and use these two as capture points or capture hooks uh, which can kind of collect flowing things in a medium. Uh, then we uh, also have these ligands and receptors essentially the very famous uh, biological lock uh, as we are popularly know this as is called the Avidan biotin lock. So, essentially these are two moieties uh, Avidan essentially a, a protein and biotin is a vitamin. Uh, and there is uh, a strong, um, uh, there is a strong bondage between the two. Uh, they have a very high affinity constant of the order of about 10 to the power of 5, uh, uh, 10 to the power of 15 I am sorry mole um, inverse. And essentially whenever these two species are together they almost always bind with each other. So, assuming that you have a biotin end group or a biotin moiety put into one of these biological entities like let us say an antibody or uh, let us say a protein of a certain interest, then you can easily bind 
two such proteins uh, by putting this uh, avidin lock in between. So, you flow uh, uh, the biotinylated antibody in question and then you put another avidin uh, molecule in between and then uh, you have uh, another biotinylated antibody. So, it can kind of form into a sandwich mechanism of two antibodies together. So, these molecular locks uh, or these concepts of ligands and receptors can be very effectively used for immobilization of some of these biological moieties on onto biochip surfaces. Okay, they are very, very commonly used in assays and uh, these have strong, especially the avidin biotin lock, it has strong affinity constant of the order of 10 to the power 15 mole inverse again. Another uh, very interesting mechanism is how uh, you can really attach these antibodies etcetera to surfaces uh, using uh, the BSA avidin complex. So, this is very interesting uh, this, this is very uh, important to describe uh, as you can see here in this particular figure. So, essentially there is a silicon dioxide surface okay, and uh, this right here is essentially the surface as you can see this is the oxide surface and uh, what you do is you take this BSA molecule with a biotinyl, biotinylation done onto this molecule. So, BSA or bovine serum albumin is essentially a protein okay. and uh, there are certain protocols in which you could actually by using um, the differential uh, binding of moieties to each other under certain pH bind the biotin moiety onto the surface of a BSA molecule. Okay. So, you can actually pass it through a protocol where you keep on changing pHs etcetera adsorb that physically onto a silica membrane and then put this biotin end group under a certain pH so that it can protonate very near to this BSA. Uh, so, they have a kind of ionic attraction and although there is not a covalent bond, but then there is a tendency of this biotin to bind to the BSA molecule. And then essentially, so you have a biotin here as you can see in this end particularly bound to the spring like BSA molecules. Okay. So, the spring like molecules on the surface are essentially what is describing BSA or bovine serum albumin. And then uh, you can use a similar mechanism to bind an antibody with a biotin end group. So, you take an antibody and uh, you pass it through the same set of filters and use uh, the variation in pH etcetera. So, that there is a uh, there is a uh, you know ionic attraction developed between uh, the modified biotin moiety and the antibody. And so, there is a some kind of affinity between the two and uh, they uh, kind of bind ionically and so you have a biotin related antibody. So, you have a biotin related BSA molecule on one end, you have a biotin related antibody on another end and all you need to do is to simply put an avidin moiety inside here. As you can look at in this particular figure, this right here is really the avidin, the green uh, area that you are seeing here is the avidin and you have a biotin related antibody on one end and another biotin related BSA. Another very interesting factor to mention here is that you know if you can really um, change the pH where the BSA binds to the surface of the silica uh, or SiO2, you could actually develop ionic attraction between uh, the positively charged BSA that means, you have a uh, kind of uh, hydrogenated amine group NH3 plus and uh, the negatively charged oxidized surface SiO minus. And so, therefore, there is always a, a uh, an ionic attraction between uh, the BSA's other end here and the surface. So, one end has been bound separately to a biotin using a pH based mechanism and then the whole moiety is brought close to the surface and again a pH based mechanism is done in order for the BSA which is biotin related to bind onto the surface using a similar chemistry or similar mechanism. And you are putting an avidin in between and then a biotin related antibody. So, see this essentially this whole structure is nothing but a molecular hook okay, where what you get is the biotin related molecule, it could be an antibody, it could be a DNA, it could be a protein and so therefore, this is a very good mechanism of binding. So, so essentially you know it is like kind of a covalent linkage uh, um, or which is developed through this BSA, avidin, biotin uh, etcetera, uh, where you can trap or hook molecules to oxide surfaces. So, having said this, let us uh, really look into some of the binding characteristics and uh, especially uh, this, this uh, again uh, holds true uh, for enzymes. Uh, 
okay. And uh, definitionally really enzymes uh, are large complex uh, macromolecules consisting as largely of proteins and, uh, and you know one prosthetic group which may be a protein or maybe uh, some kind of a non amino acid uh, organic or inorganic group. And uh, the enzymes play a very vital role by behaving like catalysts essentially to uh, move forward a reaction. So, um, we will try to investigate uh, the, the reaction kinetics in such a case and we can kind of extend that to even the antibody antigen binding or the uh, in solution or over a surface uh, pretty much in a similar manner. So, uh, let us look at uh, some of these basic kinetic uh, characteristics and equations. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the basic enzyme catalysis process really mechanism really uh, what it follows is the following. So, you have a substrate here mind you substrate essentially again is uh, the molecule or the moiety in which we are trying to uh, bind something or convert uh, into some other moiety. Okay. So, here substrate uh, does not really mean the physical meaning of it like a wafer substrate essentially means something to which. Uh, the particular biological moiety be it an antibody or an enzyme would bind. Okay. So, you have an enzyme E which is binding to a substrate S here and uh, there is essentially an equilibrium established between uh, these two. There is an intermediate complex which is formulated as you can see here E S enzyme substrate complex which is uh, uh, essentially ephemeral in nature it, it lasts very very short uh, and breaks down into an enzyme itself and the product. So, the enzyme really comes out as it is and so therefore, it is just a catalyst it does not although it participates physically into the reaction it is not a part of the product and it can retrieve itself back normally. So, you have substrate and enzyme on one side you are actually doing the reaction here at a certain equilibrium state where maybe the forward reaction has a rate constant k 1 the reverse reaction has a rate constant k minus 1 let us say it converts into an enzyme substrate complex and it again breaks down into the enzyme and the product at a, a forward reaction rate let us say k 2. Okay. So, in this kind of a situation um, let us actually uh, see an example uh, what kind of uh, uh, enzyme can do what kind of behavior to certain molecules. So, we have many times before discussed about this famous glucose detection reaction. So, glucose here is oxidized in the presence of this enzyme uh, GOD glucose oxidase in order to convert again into an enzyme substrate complex and then essentially the GOD separates out and you have gluconic acid and H2O which gets generated. So, this is an enzymatic reaction. Okay. Similar kind of reaction chemistry can as well be used for antibody antigen kinetics. Uh, it is very important to keep uh, uh, a kind of rate kinetics based uh, method to a certain whether uh, what kind of times do we need to hold these solutions on a certain substrate or maybe um, on a certain wafer for the for the moieties to bind to that wafer or indirectly if you want to perform a sandwich between two molecules in a solution what kind of time delays should you do between different steps of the chemical processes for the binding to occur. So, you have to have a good mathematical idea about the, the rate constants etcetera and so the, the enzyme the, the model that we have taken here for describing that is really the enzyme substrate reaction. Okay. So, if we apply uh, uh, steady state approximation uh, to this particular reaction system let us say this enzyme plus uh, the substrate getting into enzyme substrate and then again getting into enzyme and the product. Okay. And uh, this really is borrowed from the kinetic theory. Uh, so, so in, under this approximation it is assumed that uh, during most of the time of the reaction uh, the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex is steady that means you have a you have a constant concentration of the enzyme substrate complex as you can see here. And uh, the rate of formation of uh, the complex from its components is balanced by uh, the rate of its breakdown back to enzyme and forward uh, to its products. Okay. So, essentially the, there is some kind of a equilibrium between the enzyme substrate, enzyme substrate complex and enzyme product. Uh, let us say we have the rate of formulation of the substrate DES by DT uh, given by uh, this particular uh, equation. Okay. So, you have uh, an enzyme E uh, reacting with a substrate and the forward rate is k 1 reverse rate is k minus 1 and it is formulating E s. Again you have uh, another combination where the forward rate is k 2 let us say and you are converting into enzyme and product. 
Okay. So, here if you really look at um, the way it is formulated or the amount of uh, the substrate consumed is K 1 times of concentration of S times of concentration of E from first order kinetics. Okay. And the amount of the reverse reaction that means the breakdown of enzyme substrate complex into the enzyme and substrate is at the rate of K minus 1 times of concentration of enzyme substrate. Now, the rate of uh, formation or a rate of break breakdown of this complex in the forward direction is really K 2 times of the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex. So, therefore, because K 2 is the forward rate reaction in which the enzyme substrate complex is broken down into enzyme and product as it can be seen here. So, uh, that is really the overall uh, formation breakdown rate of the enzyme substrate complex. So, therefore, uh, the, the rate of formation of E s enzyme substrate complex is given by K 1 concentration s concentration E minus K minus 1 concentration E s and uh, the rate of breakdown of E s is K 2 concentration E s. Now, these K 1, K 2s K 1 and K 2 are the forward rates K minus 1 is the reverse rate. Okay. So, assuming this to happen uh, we can say that if uh, there is a steady state uh, behavior of this reaction and the way that the enzyme substrate is formulated or enzyme substrate complex is formulated the same as uh, you know the rate at which the enzyme products are formulated and the rate and it is same as the rate at which the enzyme and substrate independently are consumed. Uh, then basically we can equate these two rates and then say that uh, the rate of formation of uh, the complex is same as rate of uh, degradation of the complex or deformation of the complex. And uh, if we take that into picture then uh, we can say K 1 times of concentration S concentration E minus K minus 1 times of concentration E S really is equal to K 2 times of concentration E S. Okay. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, you know uh, basically the different rates all put together K minus 1 E S minus of K 2 E S is 0. Let us call this equation 1 at this time. So, we describe the enzyme concentration really in terms of uh, the total uh, concentration E 0 um, of uh, the enzyme as uh, the concentration available free with the substrate and the concentration available in the complex state with the substrate. So, essentially uh, if, if you do that then we can write uh, very safely that E 0 uh, the total enzyme available. at any given point of time can really be represented as the concentration of E and concentration of E s. Okay. You see here in the reaction really uh, let us say you have uh, the reaction written here as enzyme plus substrate giving enzyme substrate complex further giving enzyme plus product. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, the enzyme at certain point is really the sum of enzyme substrate and enzyme. Okay. So, assuming that to happen here in the whole reaction system and if we substitute this we call this equation 2 we substitute this 2 back in 1 uh, we are left with uh, the equation as K 1 S times of E 0 okay, where E 0 is the total enzyme concentration at any given point of time minus uh, K 1 times of S times of E S minus k minus 1 E s minus k 2 E s okay, is 0. So, this is by just substitution of E 0 value which is equal to the concentration of E s plus concentration of E at certain point of time in a reaction okay, equation 2. So, assuming this uh, to be true. So, uh, we are able to solve from this really the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex at any point of time uh, which is equal to uh, K 1 times of concentration of S 
times of concentration of E0 the total enzymes available times of K minus 1 plus K2 in brackets plus K1 concentration of S. So, if we divide by K1 on the numerator and denominator we are really left with enzyme substrate comp, uh, concentration as S times of E0 where S is the concentration of substrate E0 is the total enzyme concentration and this term here K minus 1 plus K2 by K1 okay, plus the concentration of S. Well, this is really uh, known as uh, the Michaelis constant okay, upon the, uh, the name of its inventor essentially and the set of equations are called the Michaelis Menten equations. So, let us call it K m Michaelis constant. So, uh, in this particular case then we can represent uh, the E s value as really concentration s concentration E 0 divided by the Michaelis constant K m plus concentration of s let us call this equation 3 all right. So, then really the overall reaction rate or rate velocity uh, rate of formation of products any of them is given by uh, the equation velocity v is uh, equal to d times of product uh, uh, formulation d uh, or sorry the dp by dt that means the rate of formulation of product or the rate of formulation or rate of degradation of the substrate minus ds by dt and given by the michaelis menten equation as k2 times e0 times of s divided by a Michaelis constant K m plus s okay, uh, because uh, essentially this is nothing but K 2 times of uh, the concentration of E s which was derived from equation 3 before all right. So, therefore, uh, the reaction velocity V here uh, really can be represented by K 2 times of E 0 the total enzyme concentration times of the concentration of substrate S divided by Michaelis constant plus the concentration of the substrate. So, there are several conditions here that this reaction or this equation can be imposed in this is let us call it 4. So, the in condition 1 let us suppose that this Michaelis constant K m somehow is uh, it is very very small in comparison to S ok. So, let us assume that uh, in condition 1 just give me a minute here. So, you have uh, the first condition here uh, called condition 1 where we assume uh, the Michaelis constant K m to be very very less than s. So, equation 4 really changes into V equals minus d s by d t equals uh, formulation of product d p by d t as K 2 E 0. Uh, because uh, essentially K m plus S can be approximated as S itself. Okay. So, therefore, um, it is really um, a case where the velocity of the reaction V uh, is uh, proportional to the concentration of the total enzyme E 0 that had been given at the, at the very beginning uh, of uh, the start of the reaction when the enzyme substrate was uh, the complex was just about to get formulated. Uh, so, therefore, uh, this is also known as uh, the maximum concentration or maximum velocity uh, V max. Okay. So, we call this the maximum rate of the reaction or V max and one of the reasons why that is so is that if suppose there is some addition to K m the value of V is always going to go down. Okay. So, therefore, mathematically also this can be uh, represented as uh, the V max or the maximum rate constant of uh, rate velocity or rate of formation of the product. Let us assume another case a uh, little bit different where the concentration of S is same uh, as the Michaelis constant and if I I will show you later in a plot uh, how these uh, different points are very very significant for understanding uh, the enzyme substrate formulation uh, reaction. So, let us say that in condition 2 here we assume uh, that this Michaelis constant K m is approximately equal to the substrate concentration S. Okay. So, in this particular case uh, what would happen is uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, 1 by V uh, from this equation 4 uh, can also be written down as K m divided by K 2 concentration E 0 concentration S plus 
uh, 1 by k2 concentration E0 which is nothing but V max as we just saw uh, a little bit before. Okay. So, we are left with um, an equation of the form uh, concentration of S equal to um, I am sorry 1 by V equal to K m divided by K 2 enzyme uh, concentration of the total enzyme time concentration of substrate plus 1 by V max okay, where V max is as you know already already K 2 times of concentration of total enzyme E 0. This here uh, right here if you assume K m and S to be equal uh, can be uh, represented as again 1 by V max plus 1 by V max. Okay. So, if K m is same as S here if you substitute this the, the concentration of S really goes off and you have 1 by K 2 E 0 which is nothing but 1 by V max. So, in this case really uh, when the concentration of uh, S is uh, equal to the Michaelis constant K m uh, V becomes V max by 2 that means, it is the half rate velocity of uh, a particular enzyme substrate formulation complex formulation reaction. Uh, so, let us plot now I mean if you look at really the curve here uh, the plot is uh, between let us say if you plot between um, you know 1 by V and 1 by S here this is going to be a linear plot uh, with a slope and an intercept the slope is essentially V max. Okay. On the other hand if you plot uh, between uh, the V max and the substrate concentration S uh, uh, the way this plot would go is uh, something uh, like you have let us say V max or V as uh, on the y axis here uh, reaction velocity and uh, substrate concentration S. Uh, in the x axis. So, in this particular case uh, as we can see that as k m is very very smaller than s and uh, the v really approaches v max. So, let us say if we have a straight line here describing uh, what we know as v max uh, then the reaction rate really should be asymptotically approaching uh, this v max line. Um, and, and this is what the relationship between V and S would really look like. So, a plot of V max by 2 on this particular equation would correspond to a point on the substrate concentration axis which would be equal to the Michaelis constant K m. So, this is essentially an experimental method of determining from reaction chemistry what the Michaelis constant K m uh, would really mean at a certain substrate concentration. So, uh, if you know what V max is based on your initial enzyme concentration which is known mind you in a particular reaction this is really known okay. and uh, K 2 is of course, the forward rate um, at which um, the enzyme substrate is broken down into uh, the enzyme and product. So, it is the product formulation rate K 2 is again the product formulation rate. So, if you know these two uh, which would give you an indication of V max then you could really find out what the Michaelis constant K m is by looking at the substrate concentration where at, at a point of intercept on the curve corresponding to V max by 2. So, this is uh, really how the rate, kinet, uh, the rate kinetics of the, of the enzyme substrate reactions happen and as a matter of fact uh, any antibody antigen reaction also are kind of governed by the same set of equations. Uh, only thing is that uh, um, uh, in, in this case probably the, the, rate, uh, the reaction uh, kinetics is uh, uh, not bound by the formulation of an intermediate state it is just a, a product formulating from uh, a substrate uh, and uh, the participation of antibody is there uh, on both ends of the reaction. So, <laughs> let us look at a little more details of what really the antibody is or what their structures are uh, in order to understand more. So, uh, Number one, uh, the very important fact is that an antibody can be developed against any substrate, uh, um, any any substance, uh, popularly known as antigen, uh, 
uh, and it can be raised essentially. Um, uh, and so, the, the idea is that the antibody developed so developed would be highly highly selective uh, to the substrate. Okay. So, essentially the antibody can be developed against any substrate um, and uh, can be made a very highly selective material to a particular substrate. Uh, you can raise antibodies within an organism. Uh, the idea is that um, antibodies as we know are proteins formulated by um, so called B cells within the um, within a certain living living organism. And uh, essentially um, the, the organisms can be used to develop antibodies which can be later on used for uh, the purpose of capture or specific recognition in vitro. So, therefore, organisms develop antibodies which are proteins and they can bind with an invading antigen and remove it uh, from harm as follows. So, the antigen and antibody binds together to form uh, this particular complex and uh, the affinity constant in this particular case is actually the formulation of the, or the concentration of complex divided by concentration of independent antigen antibody uh, and usually it is very very high not as high as the avidin uh, biotin link. Uh, but again k is usually about 10 to the power of 6 mole inverse uh, in case of uh, antigen antibody binding which is a pretty high affinity constant. So, if you really look at antibodies they are y shaped uh, mechanisms like you can see here. So, you have uh, th these sections here at the stem of the y uh, which are really light chains okay. and uh, the two upper sections here which are the heavy chains. Okay, and uh, essentially, uh, the the overall structure of the the antibody by and large remains constant. Uh, there is no much variation, except the fact that uh, there are certain subtypes based on what these chains are really. In mammalian cells or, or in mammalian organisms, typically uh, there are about five different kind of such subunits. Uh, which uh, uh, can be categorized as this heavy chain light chain structures or antibodies. Well, what is interesting though is that uh, you know the, the portion here um, uh, on an antibody um, which is actually known as an epitope site is the only variation in the whole antibody. By and large the other subtypes of the antibodies which are available are only 5 in number, but if you look at the amount or the, or the amount of variation that these particular sites would have or the epitope sites would have they, they can be different million different antibodies uh, of uh, corresponding to binding or, or, or which can be capable of binding to million different biological entities. So, essentially this keeps on changing the epitope site keeps on changing whereas, the, uh, the other part of the y that means these light chains and these heavy chains by and large remain uh, similar except categorization into a few subtypes. So, they uh, the different uh, subtypes are also known as isotypes. Um, isotypes are essentially based on which heavy chain the antibody would possess. So, as I indicated before there are about 5 different antibody isotypes known in mammals so far and that is all the range that uh, the antibody could have except the fact that the epitopes are varied and numerous in region. Okay. So, uh, an antibody essentially made up of this uh, epitope with the heavy and light chain isotype uh, can bind to different targets and the targets that they typically bind to are known as antigens. Also there is a huge diversity of the antibodies uh, which allows uh, the immune system to recognize an equally wide diversity of the antigenic systems. So, the uni unique part of antigen uh, is recognized by an uh, by an antibody called an epitope as I have indicated earlier and shown in, in the particular figure. So, there are several uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, using um, uh, antibodies. Uh, one of the most uh, prominent um, advantages are the selectiveness or the selectivity that these antibodies would normally possess between the different strains. Uh, another uh, uh, very important advantage is that these antibodies are ultra sensitive okay, to any kind of uh, uh, small variation in the analyte of interest. I mean the binding or unbinding uh, is typically dependent on what is the characteristic of uh, the particular analyte. If there is a slight variation and also uh, if there is a slight variation in the ambient, uh, it can change the way that the antibody would form a complex with the, the antigen or bind with the antigen. Uh, although when they bind they do bind very very powerfully and that bond cannot be easily broken up 
uh, uh, the only disadvantage is that uh, uh, there is no catalytic effect in this particular binding between antigen and antibody as happens in the case of enzyme. So, here whatever is bound is bound I mean it cannot be reconverted back into uh, a proper I mean a, uh, a pure antibody again or a pure antigen again it is a irre irreversible reaction uh, of formation of the antibody antigen complex. So, by and large these are some of the advantages and dis disadvantages of uh, antibody antigen systems. Uh, let us now turn into a little bit different uh, component how we can immobilize uh, the different biological components. We have done a little bit of this while looking at sensors, but essentially um, as is obvious the next question which comes into being is after we have kind of understood the reaction kinetics uh, and also tried to find out more details of the structure of these different biological moieties, how do we really use them in, in sensors and uh, therefore immobilization. Uh, protocols are very very important uh, for that. So, there are various methods for uh, immobilizing um, uh, can be absorption, uh, it can be micro encapsulated, can be entrapped on a particular electrode or a substrate, um, you can cross link or covalently bond a certain biological moiety or entity. Okay. Uh, so, uh, really uh, the lifetime uh, of a biosensor uh, is, is greatly greatly enhanced uh, by a proper immobilization technique. If you can choose the right immobilization technique you can use the biosensors many times uh, usably without uh, really uh, uh, very many changes onto the sensor uh, surface. So, uh, based on the adsorption method that uh, or ba based on the particular immobilization method uh, from this different range of methods that I have stated before just about a minute back absorption, micro encapsulation, entrapment, cross linking or covalent bonding. Uh, the typical lifetimes of a biosensors also vary a lot like for example, in case of adsorption this is only about a day or so. Adsorbed uh, substances really do not uh, stay very long onto a surface and they are um, kind of uh, prone to uh, deabsorbing based on change in the partial pressure of the atmosphere in which such a surface would be kept. Uh, the membrane entrapment that uh, we have talked about here is typically uh, about a one week lifetime. Uh, it is pretty stable uh, because membranes are essentially uh, thin perforated structures which would be able to hold these biological moieties very very close uh, to a particular substrate. Uh, for physically entrapment, uh, physical entrapment cases uh, it is about 3 to 4 weeks the device lifetime is greatly greatly entrapped because of en enhanced because of the uh, schematic wherein this entrapment is in a gel kind of a network and for covalent entrapment again it is very high because there is a covalent bond now between the particular moiety it is about 4 to 14 months. Details of the different immobilization aspects and schemes. Uh, the first aspect which comes into picture is adsorption. Uh, what really adsorption uh, is, uh, uh, is really I mean it is kind of some kind of either physical uh, or chemical uh, attachment. Uh, over a surface physical by, by physical uh, attachment over a surface uh, what we mean is that you know if there is a size based selection of a certain moiety on a surface uh, that could be uh, said as physically adsorbed onto the surface. Uh, chemical adsorption on the other hand could be because of very many reasons one could be just ionic attraction between uh, the moiety and the surface they are ionically opposite in nature and there is a ionic bond which is formulated between the two or uh, due to van der Waals forces uh, there may be uh, the tendency of a particular chemical to adsorb onto the surface it is uh, the weak interactions uh, between um, the moiety and the surface. So, many substances really adsorb um, enzymes particularly um, on their surfaces. So, the examples could be alumina, uh, charcoal, clay, cellulose, kaolin, silica gels, glass, collagen etcetera. One of the reasons why uh, if, you, if you look at really the, the microstructural aspect of these surfaces they are all very highly porous in nature and uh, essentially more surface area is involved. So, therefore, uh, if the area is more uh, there is a tendency of the adsorption of a particular moiety uh, to be more. So, adsorption is, is a dependent phenomena on typically the number of binding sites that a surface has to offer if you have more surface area more binding sites you have more adsorption. So, some of the advantages uh, of this process are that typically no reagent is required okay. that is the biggest advantage that adsorption has to provide that there is absolutely no reagent required. 
and uh, also there is no clean up step um, and uh, there is less disruption uh, to something like a biological moiety, moiety an enzyme or an antibody uh, just because uh, as less as possible you know the involvement of chemical steps are as less as possible essentially. So, adsorption uh, can be classified into physisorption and chemisorption this is physical adsorption this is chemical adsorption and uh, people have been really studying uh, this adsorption on a, on a very uh, modular manner. Uh, as, as I have already indicated physics option typically is caught by van der Waals uh, bonds which are usually weak and occasionally uh, hydrophobic hydrophobic interactions or a charge transfer process or uh, hydrogen bonding ok. That is how physics option would typically occur. Uh, chemis option on the other hand uh, would be usually by the formation of covalent bonds uh, and, and it is a much much more. Uh, a much much usually much stronger process um, of, of adsorption onto the onto the surface. So, uh, the adsorption phenomena uh, can be modeled as you can see here by the, the Langmuir adsorption isotherm. Um, uh, what, what this equation really relates is that relates the coverage of adsorption to the molecules on a solid surface uh, to gas pressure or concentration of a medium above the solid surface at a fixed temperature ok. So, essentially is also known as the Langmuir adsorption equation ok. So, what is important for a for an adsorption process one is the amount of active bonding sites or binding sites um, which is also a function of the active available surface area of a particular moiety that is very very critical. Another is uh, especially in gas phase absorption uh, the the, the vapor pressure which is over the surface is very very critical to determine what is the adsorption if the pressure is a little higher then the adsorption rate automatically increases because you can uh, think about it as you know some kind of a forcing mechanism for the molecules to seep through the different vias and trenches on a particular surface and so therefore if the partial pressure is high in the atmosphere uh, the pa is high then the adsorption rate is automatically increased so adsorption uh, is typically given or described by this equation here let us say s dash is uh, the, the number of sites which are available on a particular surface um, you are absorbing particles pre onto these s dash or s star sites onto that surface and uh, uh, the filled particle sites are represented as s s p. So, typically there is an equilibrium between these two. So, you have s star which is the number of active available sites and p uh, number of particles and then this is the filled site or uh, number of sites which are uh, fully filled sp. So, there is an equilibrium between uh, these as you can see. So, the equilibrium constant here is really uh, directly proportional to the concentration of sp and uh, it is inversely proportional to the concentration of the active available sites and the concentration of the particle p let us call this k ok. So, equilibrium constant here is the concentration of S p by concentration of S star and p. So, let us assume that uh, uh, the, the fraction of filled surface sites is equal to theta. The fraction of unfilled sites at a particular point instant of uh, time is 1 minus theta. So, you assume that you have a total number of uh, let us say you know uh, uh, the total number of sites as n and uh, uh, the fraction of those sites uh, is theta means theta n are the number of filled sites and 1 minus theta n are the number of unfilled sites. So, uh, Langmuir uh, what he did is he kind of tried to experimentally observe uh, that how the rate of adsorption uh, would be behaving if uh, theta is increased or the fraction of the active sites or, or fraction of the filled surface sites are increased with time and he found out uh, that there is a uh, relationship between uh, theta. So, if theta is decreased and the number of uh, active sites are increased the adsorption rate would increase it is a directly proportional relationship. Also what he found out is if the pre partial pressure is high um, the, uh, the rate of adsorption would increase. So, if you put this all together in an equation you are left with rate of adsorption equal to k a is the adsorption constant times p a partial vapor pressure times n of uh, 
1 minus theta. So, this essentially is the number of active sites which are available 1 minus theta mind you is the fraction of uh, uh, the sites which are available for binding or uh, they are still not used up and n is the total number uh, of sites which are available. So, n times of 1 minus theta is really the, the number of sites which are available uh, onto a certain surface uh, for the binding to happen or the adsorption to take place. So, the rate is proportional to the partial pressure as you can see and also proportional to the number of active sites on the surface here. Similarly, the rate of desorption uh, the ability of a surface to lose a particular adsorbed species from it is proportional to uh, the number of filled sites that are on the surface. So, if the number of filled sites are more then the tendency of the material to get desorbed from the surface is also automatically increased which makes uh, sense and is more logical. Therefore, uh, let us say the K D is the uh, is the reaction rate for the desorption and the desorption really is independent of pressure. So, whatever the partial pressure be the desorption would appear to be or the, would happen at a rate which is totally totally independent of that particular partial pressure. It is only a function of the number of sites uh, which are filled or bound on a surf surface and it goes up with uh, the number of sites which are filled or bound. Okay. So, K d n theta is the rate of desorption. So, at equilibrium if we assume that these two rates of adsorption and desorption are equal and then whatever is adsorbed after a while you know after the steady state has been reached would uh, after, after all the active sites have been kind of filled up would typically desorb of the surface or typically not bind. Then uh, we can calculate theta by equating these two let us say this is 1 and 2 they equate these two equations uh, as k times of P A by 1 minus k P A where k is uh, the ratio between the adsorption constant and the desorption constant k by k d okay. and theta the number of filled sites on a particular surface is nothing but uh, the ratio of the adsorption desorption constant times of the partial pressure of the particular medium divided by 1 plus k times of Pa. Okay. K is the ratio of the adsorption and desorption constant as you can see here in this particular expression. So, that is what uh, uh, would happen typically when a, in a gas phase adsorption process there is an equilibrium which is achieved or reached. And this gives you some idea of how you could study adsorption uh, especially physics option on a particular surface. Let us look at uh, a different technique now the micro encapsulation as I have been talking about before. So, uh, it is really uh, the trapping of a moiety or a, uh, a biological moiety in between two membranes okay, or two membranous structures. So, in this particular method an inert membrane is prepared and it is used to trap uh, the biomaterial of interest on the transducer surface and uh, essentially uh, for the very first time this technique was developed for a glucose biosensor and uh, this was developed on an oxygen electrode. Okay. So, it is uh, essentially developed on an oxygen electrode uh, originally for a glucose biosensor. So, there are several advantages of uh, the micro uh, encapsulation process. Okay. Uh, one definite advantage as can be illustrated here is that there is a close attachment between the biomaterial and the transducer surface. You can think about this, this uh, particular membrane set to hold together the biological entity very very close to a certain surface and uh, the, therefore, uh, this kind of provides a firm binding mechanism uh, of closeness of the entity to the particular uh, sensor surface uh, that is being used. Uh, so, definitely uh, it is much more closer as an attachment than let us say an adsorption where it may just randomly adsorb on a surface uh, without taking care of any textural issues of the particular surface. So, there is also uh, this, this process is also very very adaptable and also very reliable okay? uh, because typically you do not have to modify the sensor surface that is an advantage you are trapping using external membrane without any modification chemical or physical whatsoever on the sensor surface. The reliability of the biomaterial is maintained uh, particularly the enzyme or whatever you are immobilizing because you are not chemically again reacting uh, you are keeping the biological entity in its original state as it is supposed to be. So, uh, therefore, uh, this results in a high degree of specificity almost always okay? because you cannot uh, you are not modifying chemically the biomaterial. Uh, that you want to uh, place onto a surface and also 
uh, there is a good stability to changes in pH because uh, essentially uh, since the biomaterial is in its own state, is it in its own nascent state, no chemical change uh, whatsoever. Uh, therefore, uh, pH change would typically only induce very small changes to the parent molecule, whatever those changes are would get registered as opposed to a case where you would have modified the biomaterial already. So, the changes would be much more drastic in nature. Okay. Uh, it also uh, stabilizes uh, the material against uh, uh, different ionic strengths of the solutions and different substrate concentrations. It can act as an inbuilt device to limit contamination and biodegradation. Um, because again uh, you are not handling or you are not uh, playing with the biomaterials chemical property in general and uh, uh, it can be used to prevent infection because uh, you are trying to guard the biomaterial using a membrane and trying to guard it from getting um, you know in touch or getting contaminated with the patient's uh, fluid samples which you are trying to measure with this. So, you could always of course, uh, have an option of uh, binding uh, the biological molecules uh, that conduct electrons such as uh, polypyrrole etcetera uh, to make the membrane. So, that you could actually have a electron transparent path from the biological moiety onto the sensor surface. So, some of the membranes uh, uh, that are used in this kind of uh, micro encapsulation are cellulose acetate. Uh, remember dialysis membranes are made up of uh, cellulose acetate and uh, they are put external to the body. Uh, wherein the blood is flown and, and there is always uh, some kind of a uh, separation of uh, essentially urea and other harmful salts in the blood. This can uh, this which excludes proteins and stops the transportation of other interfering uh, species. Uh, this particular cellulose acetate membrane um, is kind of due to its uh, uh, hydrophobic nature uh, kind of prevents uh, the, the the proteins um, or some other interfering species to get filtered um, uh, across it. Uh, then you have other uh, kind of structures uh, like PTFE polytetrafluoroethylene membranes, nephion is a very good material, polyurethane etcetera which can use which can be used successfully as uh, for micro encapsulating the biological moieties. Uh, the next uh, in line is entrapment. That is uh, another very important mechanism here, um, you are really entrapping the material in a gel kind of matrix. So, instead of uh, binding it together within a membrane or within between two membranes, you are now trying to uh, bind it by entrapping it into a polymeric gel kind of matrix okay, in this particular approach. And uh, for that you first prevent uh, prepare a solution uh, and then gelate it later in suitable conditions after the enzyme or whatever biological moiety you are talking about is trapped within the gel matrix. And then finally, a coating of this gel layer is provided over the transducer surface. So, uh, this process also has some limitations, um, one is uh, that a large barrier is created, essentially you have no control on the, uh, the distance of the biological moiety from the sensor surface as there is a thick gel which is entrapping uh, the moiety in its thickness and uh, the thickness of the gel can be made thinner and thinner, but still there is no active control on where the entity is present. Is it towards the sensor surface or is it away from the sensor surface on to the other surface of the gel? Uh, we do not have control on that aspect while preparing and so therefore, sometimes large barriers are created and uh, they can do all sort of uh, things like inhibit diffusion of substrates, uh, you know it can, it can slow down the reaction in general. Uh, and therefore, uh, sometimes uh, this is all at a cost of uh, the response time of the sensor, it gets drastically changed because of fat or thick gel layers entrapping the enzymes. Uh, also there is a loss sometimes of enzyme activity because the gel surrounding is natural, is, is really not the natural sound surrounding of a certain enzyme and therefore, whatever chemical properties the gel has would definitely have an influence on the enzyme itself. So, there is of course, a loss in enzyme activity. Um, particularly through the pores of uh, the particular gel. So, some uh, typically used gels uh, are polychromide, starch, nylon, uh, glutaraldehyde and some other conducting polymers etcetera. Okay. Um, the other technique which is important uh, to, to be understood is cross linking. Um, uh, this is an approach essentially where uh, a biological moiety is uh, um, 
kind of bound to a biosensor with a crosslinker molecule. So, you have some kind of a ligand molecule which is uh, on one side bonded to the biological entity and on another side bonded to the particular surface uh, in, in question. Okay. So, we call it a biofunctional, a, a bifunctional agent, uh, this kind of crosslinker molecule uh, and, and it is used for binding the biomaterial to solid supports. Okay. It has been uh, of course, uh, proven to be very useful technique, uh, particularly to stabilize the adsorbed enzymes. And uh, uh, of course, this technique also has some limitations. Uh, some of them is that it sometimes causes damage to the enzymes because you are playing around with the chemical nature of the enzyme itself. You are trying to modify the enzyme to kind of cross link it to the linker molecule or the, or the ligand molecule. So, it causes some damage uh, to the normal functionality of the enzyme because its structure is changed and proteins as you know are extremely sensitive to this uh, change in conformation. Their whole properties change because of uh, a slight change in the conformation of the molecule. Uh, also, uh, one more interesting factor here is that uh, the diffusion of the substrate is sometimes limited because uh, uh, cross linkers typically form a dense brush like material onto the surface of the sensor which can inhibit uh, the flow of the substrate material very close to the electrode resulting in loss in information and loss in signal connection. And of course, there is a very poor rigidity or mechanical strength because these are all just uh, sometimes chemically. Uh, cross linked and they are themselves not very strong as, as molecular bonds and uh, so therefore, we have to largely depend and rely on um, you know the nature of um, the material. Okay. So, uh, some examples uh, are typically the cross links that are formulated uh, to system residues in proteins etcetera. Um, uh, the other mechanism that I would like to talk about is really covalent bonding. Uh, wherein as you can see here, uh, some of these uh, um, functional groups present within the biological moiety is directly bonded onto the, onto the surface. And uh, essentially it can be covalently bonded to the support matrix to uh, just be a part of the surface and uh, do its job. Uh, so, uh, the method can use uh, um, the, the presence of groups such as NH2, COOH, OH, C6H4OH, SH etcetera develop charge on it. So, that this charge could ionically bond or attract or do some kind of a direct covalent bonding with groups onto the onto the substrate surface. Now, these for example, are some of the illustrations where it talks about how uh, different moieties can be covalently bonded onto the substrate surface. So, with this I would like to end this particular lecture uh, and we will cover uh, some stuff related to um, you know things like cyclic voltammetry and some related to electrochemistry on an electrode surface in the next lecture. Okay, thank you.